everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. Today is a very important podcast. We've got a special guest here, and we're going to be covering the Iron Flow battery for renewable energy for uh, wind, solar. You got to have energy storage. But this is the first part of a series with my guest, and we are going to be covering geopolitical impacts and migrations and an energy crisis that is looming. So thank you very much, George McMillan, for stopping by. You're the CEO of McMillan and Associates, I believe. Yeah, it's a new company just starting. So we um, we want to get into geopolitical consulting, and it's going to be over energy, obviously. Uh, the papers I've been writing are on uh, energy and geopolitical realignment. We'll get into that a little bit later. Yep. But I've been working overseas for the past 13 years. And you get a whole different perspective when you're working in the Middle East and Central Asia. You know, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of different projects, a lot of ac different academic projects. We'll get into that. Um, but yeah, I've been working with, with Tim Kalen. He was on the previous show. Uh, former CIA and he's trying to and 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 Newsmax and he's been trying to get a uh, he's been trying to get the iron flow battery operation because the, the iron flow batteries is really essential yep if you have solar and wind you obviously need to store it uh you know for nighttime and and winter time when there's right areas where there's not a lot of sunshine and there's just not enough nickel, cadmium, and lithium in the world to support right. electric vehicles and uh, and household batteries. The iron flow batteries are huge. They're not suitable to put in electric vehicles because they're too big. But if you're going to put them in your backyard, they're just fine. And it's made out of uh, more available materials, you know, all iron and sodium, things like that. Right. They're also biodegradable. Isn't so that great? The, yeah. Well, now, see, that's one of my biggest hot buttons with these huge storage farms is you putting in the storage and it's toxic and you can't recycle them. I mean, the recycling is just way too expensive. There's only one manufacturer and it's Frere Battery out of Norway that is making recyclable battery technology. And so you sit back and kind of go, when when I had my conversation with him, I mean, it was phenomenal because it was, he said, it it is market ready without subsidies. Holy smokes, George, that is huge. And when it is, so you're not having subsidies for it, but yet it, it would qualify for some, I bet. So that would help investors if they were wanting to invest in it. Um, anyway, this is a huge, huge project, George. Yeah, it's a big project. There are, you know, the, the technology, it's one of those things where the technology has been out for a while. Right. No one's, you know, put in the tens of millions of dollars it actually takes to build a big factory and mass produce them and drop unit cost. Right. But there's, you know, there's so many solar fields all over the place and wind farms. Okay, I'm here in, uh, in the Premium Basin. You drive around West Texas, the, you know, the, you know, those windmills are on top of all the hills and there's all these big solar farms and it's like that across the Southwest as far as, and other countries also, but you would really need to store that energy. And th yeah, there's no way you can do that with, uh, with, lith with rare earth metal based batteries and also have EVs, even if you, there's not even enough lithium and nickel and cadmium to even produce enough electric vehicles for all the people that are going to need them. You're, you would, right. I guess they plan to move everybody to these 15 minute cities. So then 80% of the population won't need a vehicle. I guess that's what they're thinking, or that's what the, the yeah. room is. Yeah. That's what they want. That's what they've stated as their objective. Right. And then I guess use mass transportation or whatever, um, you know, trying to guess their motives. There's different, different people are arguing different things but yeah you would you have a big advantage in that they're the well since the um since the precursors to making these things are abundant they're right. doable 
But what the holdback has been is the companies now that that just make them as one-off prototypes, they're super expensive, but they're getting their subsidies right now. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a, you know, it's a sure thing. So they don't want to leave the sure thing and then bet $50 million to try to right. drop these costs and then try to find a market for them. Nobody wants to take that risk because they're very comfortable in getting their government subsidies. But right. then the market can never get past infancy to maturity as long as that occurs. Right. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. The wind farm failure right now is, is like uh, Orsted uh, backing out and spending, uh, um, you know, they've lost billions and they're about to lose a billion this year. And even with subsidies, wind is not sustainable uh, and it's fin- fiscally uh, irresponsible. So this battery by being that is huge now do you think that they could get the subsidies to go for the base models and start getting that uh in there to ramp this bad dog up i mean that to me seems like it would be worthy does that make sense from a fiscally oh yeah that... well i mean part of the reason why tim wants to get you know the, get the word out there right is, is to try to start generating interest in that because if, if you have companies losing you know tens of millions or and, and what you were talking right. about is billions well then that would have already paid for the new factories anyway right so, yeah this yeah I, I guess they're going for bailouts then um again yep. it's, it's just money down the drain the technology is there they need to get rid of the subsidies and start investing into these new well and manufacturing the new technologies you know right because there's a whole bunch of countries that could use this oh absolutely yeah. and 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 if you're going to go solar and or wind when they're the technology is ready you got to have storage it's just not an option so this is exciting um it would be interesting to see yeah if we could get enough interest from the investment community to actually get that started right Tim has spent a lot of time in, in getting a team together to uh, to move this forward. He, he's uh, He's got a master's degree in electrical engineering. So he's right. talking to other people and, and CFOs. Uh, he's got a team and yeah, they need uh, they need a group of investors. I was doing the the geopolitical aspect of it, right? Yeah, you know, if you want to move towards, move towards that angle. Right. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, when you take a look at uh, one of your papers uh, on LinkedIn is fabulous. I want to give everybody a shout out to George. His name's George McMillan. Go look him up on LinkedIn. Your articles are phenomenal. Uh, the one that you just released out there, the role in energy and geopolitical realignment was huge. I mean, we've been chit-chatting about that and your insights because of your boots on the ground are just, George, unbelievable. Uh, That's a line in the sandbox that everybody needs to sit and listen to. Yeah, I did that and another, you know, six, seven page paper on, um, on the different rivalries and well, the Sunni versus Shia rivalry and and Lebanon, right, and and energy. So there's there's a whole bunch of angles here, because what I wanted to talk about first was, and I've been talking about it was, Trump had the United States energy independent when he was president, right, right. and you know he wanted to build the Keystone pipeline and open up more areas for drilling, because. Natural gas, like, well, T. T Boone Pickens has been talking about it before he died, you know, for a long time, that natural gas is by far the cheapest and cleanest form of energy. Yep. So Trump really wanted to increase production in that and open up um, and open up more um, gas and oil fields. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're stopped by the by the by the left. So now the problem that that the United States has, well, they have several, is that Russian natural gas, and this is what some of my papers have been about, and you'll get a, a, 
I'll be posting a flurry more of them. I need to get them published in some of the oil industry outlets is what I'm going right. to be doing while I'm here. Okay. Is Russian gas by pipeline is by far the cheapest. And this is what the realignment paper was about. The Since the Reagan administration, the United States has been scared to death of cheap Russian natural gas and oil shipped by pipeline going through Eastern Europe into Western Europe. Right. Because they have basically endless amount of reserves in the Caspian area, in the Arctic, and yep. in uh, central Siberia and the Far East. They could resupply Western Europe as well as China, Japan, and South Korea. Note that Putin was just in North Korea. The media was talking about he, he must be begging for uh, artillery shells. I think that's nonsense. I think it's about laying a pipeline because every he's basically head of Gazprom. Right. He never goes anywhere without talking about building pipelines. So my guess is he wants to build pipelines through North Korea to South Korea. The reason being anything hooked up to Russian natural gas, their industry is going to be more globally competitive than those that are not hooked up to it. Like LNG, this could be a huge impact to the Asian LNG import area. Yeah. And then there's what I've been writing papers about, and I want to publish them in, in, in some bigger outlets. Right. Is once the more that they build pipelines to China, right, the less competitive. Japan gets. So Japan would eventually have to switch sides and start buying natural gas in rubles, or at least that's what the fear of the United States is. Right. The United States did uh, was involved, I think it was Exxon, BP, and Shell, if I'm not mistaken, in the Sakhalin pipelines just north of Hokkaido Island in Japan. With sanctions, they pulled out. You had a war on the other side in Ukraine and the chaotic withdrawal of Afghanistan. Right. I think that withdrawal was to create chaos on one side, slap sanctions on Russia. We'll do the breakdown later on. I'm trying to right. sit right. behind this. To, wow. stop, to stop the, Sak the Hokkaido to Sakhalin uh, undersea tunnel project that they were building because with a railway tunnel that they had proposed would, wow. would come natural gas and oil pipelines as well. If Japan started building that project and ran undersea pipelines, just like Nord Stream or South Stream that was stopped, right. we'll get different pipelines as we, as we progress. But if Japan did that, then how long, how much longer would it be that South Korea's, you know, cars and electronics become less cost competitive and they need to tap into that? Just a way just to broach this subject is South Korea would have to switch and you would have a gas pipeline that goes through North Korea. Of course, Kim Jong-un would, would take the oil transfer fees because he would get bleed off from that also. Yep. If if Japan if uh, Japan and South Korea switched sides and started paying in rubles, you would have those two allies leaving the petrodollar trading scheme and the U.S. orbit. Right. The post Cold War alliances from George Kennan's Five Power Doctrine was that North America would be in one industrial power center, connected to Europe at another industrial power center, and connected to, to Japan and South Korea and Taiwan as a 
Pacific Rim Power Center. Right. That would leave. There's different versions of it, but in this one, that would have le- that would have left Russia and China to be the countries that you want to surround. Right. And you want to divide them by getting into the Central Asian stands and split them. This would have been especially after Mao Zedong and Stalin uh, had their disagreements because Stalin treated them like a, uh, a second-class citizen of communist powers. Right. So from that original five power center doctrine of, you know, Gaddis Smith of, of Yale talked about it. He also talked about it in the War College just as, a, as an academic sighting. But that is what our current alliances are. With the Russian pipelines going from Central Europe into Eastern Europe, and I'm 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 sorry, Eastern Germany and into Western Germany in 1982, right? And Alfred Herhashov her of Deutsche Bank built a pipeline to connect them. It was then blown up. I need to make an important point here because that happened in 1982. Of course, he was assassinated in 1989. It doesn't matter where the pipelines blow up, inside Russia or outside Russia. The aim is always to stop cheap Russian oil and gas from going to Russia to an end user in Europe. Right. And prevent the end user from leaving the petrodollar system and paying in rubles. Wow. The way you measure the way uh, the way governments in geostrategic planning measure uh, political power is in Promethean dime models. That's diplomatic, infrastructural, military, economic, or political, military, economic, social, infrastructural, and informational. Right. So you're talking about um with more tra- with more telecommunications and transportation, your economy improves. Right. In economics, it'd be the Solo Swan models or Rostow takeoff models. So you're adding those things into the original Clausewitz and Bismarck's statements that you know the, your economy is built on blood and steel, and your diplomacy is only as big as your military, and your military is only as big as your economy can supply them with war materials, logistics. So those are the national power measures. If you start to get lose allies because you can't supply them with cheap energy, well, then your diplomatic is eroded. In this case, what the United States was trying to stop with the pipeline is once you have the infrastructural aspect of two countries aligned. Right. The rest of the DIME and PAMISI acronyms follow. So once you build the pipelines to Western Europe, wow. Then Russia becomes aligned with Western Europe. Right. That means they're unaligned with NATO, the UK, and the US. Right. So what ever since 1982, and then it increased after the fall of the Soviet Union when it shifted into the Russian Federation instead, NATO is moved eastward to block the entry points for all the pipelines. Wow. It's got nothing to do with democracy because you could have, you could follow the old Pizarian plan of uniting of having Poland and Ukraine as neutral zones right. along, along with Austria and Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Okay. But that was that was quickly discarded uh well by Wolfowitz and and Cheney and Rumsfeld. Uh right. Jeffrey Katz talks a lot about that. That was right. discarded because, okay, the UK had always been blocking in Russia's three ports. Right. Petersburg, Sevastopol, and Vladivostok on the other side. As big as a country is, as big as Russia is, they got oil and natural gas all over, but they only have three ports. Right. 
And is that why they took Crimea so yeah. that they could have that other sea base? There were like eight bases in there they needed, and that's why they took Crimea. Is that a correct statement? Correct. Okay. Yeah, the taking moving the EU into Eastern Europe, they put NATO riders in there that they may not right. necessarily join NATO at first, but they have to meet NATO military standards. So you're meeting NATO anyway. Okay, you're de facto. Yeah. Okay. So they moved into, this is how well thought out this whole Nord Stream thing is. They moved into Poland, Ukraine, and Georgia as match sets to block in all the old ports. Right. And all the pipeline access so then they can charge heavy transfer fees. Right. When you get into the grand strategies of Alfred Theremahan, he starts talking about the importance of, he does sea power versus sea power theories. Right. He was a, after the Civil War, he taught at uh, Annapolis and West Point. Okay. His influence of, of sea power on history is always, uh, is based on uh, basically Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations and David Ricardo's comparative advantage. The difference between wealth between production and wealth is if you can trade from what you have an abundance of to what you need is how you actually uh, get more than you have and you have uh, you have wealth. So you need trade overseas. So if you can block other countries from trading and increase your own trade, you're increasing your your wealth. If you're increasing your wealth, you're increasing your national instruments of, of power. You have police. Right. People wonder why I talk about that because these model, these type of modeling isn't talked about outside of government. Right. But it, it's what's the land power versus sea power uh, theories of Mahan and uh, Mackinder and then the, the ones that come, come after that. Right. Is what actually our foreign policy is based on. You see a lot of people talking about you see a lot of veterans, you know, wondering what um, American foreign policy has been for the past uh, two decades in GWAT, you know, global right. warfare. And yeah, it's based on the old, it's still based on the old five power center doctrine, which is blocking in their, their seaports. People say, oh, Mahan and McKinder are dated. Well, no, the geography stays the same, except it shifts from just blocking in the seaports to having to block in the pipelines also. So mm -hmm. now after making that aside for just a, a quick explanation of how you measure national wealth and power back to the Russian cheap gas, because if you have infrastructural integration, your economic integration follows, then your diplomatic integration follows, then you have something to protect so the military integration follows. Right. So in West, and then I want to go back to the other side and back to Japan again. I need to go a little bit back and forth here. Absolutely. Because the, the people, the one, one quick thing, people don't understand that it's all interrelated. And this explanation, George, that you're doing is phenomenal. Um, because I'm sitting here, I've got about 50 different things and I'm glad this is a series, not just this one discussion. Cause I'm over here putting about 16 other pieces that I didn't know these pieces that fit. So go ahead. I, sorry for interrupting, but I'm just all yeah. of this stuff. Not many people look at a global first order, second order effect, uh, way of looking at things and you're phenomenal on how you're describing this so sorry okay where oh, were you yeah yeah go ahead the um the, i was talking about the the well okay the reason why i, I do an explanation going around eurasia right. is because people will know their area and their field but they don't right. know what's going on in their, in all the other countries exactly okay i didn't just go there and work for a year and leave I stayed there yep. because, you know, I, I, I go on vacation through Eastern Europe 
I vacation in Southeast Asia. I'm a military history buff. So I go look at all the old uh, CIA air bases in Laos and Cambodia and, and well, and, and, and Thailand. Yep. So I, and, and, uh, and Myanmar as well. So I get to see a lot of, you know, I just happen to get to see a lot of things and put a lot of things together. Right. Then people know their area that they study academically, but they don't know the other ones. And then they won't know the grand strategies and the right. instruments of national power of how you measure that and how they're connected. So I put this thing out to break people out of their tunnel vision so they can start understanding the grand strategies. Yep. The grand strategies are widely taught in India. Hmm. They're not widely taught in America. You can guess why. You can buy the books, by the way. They're on my shelves. I got a, a bunch here at, at this place. And then I have another stack at, at in Tim's office in, in, in yep. South Florida. So, yeah, for what actually runs our government and what actually policy is made on, right. it's not an emphasis that's widely known. So yeah, I want people to watch as many Alfred Thayer Mahan videos as you can. Double okay. check. What, I want people to double check what I'm saying. Right. Because once you go down this rabbit hole, there's no unseeing it. Nope. And as many McKinder videos as you can. There's not a lot, but you don't need a lot. You just have to get the gist of, you know, the sea power versus other sea powers right. and then mckinder focuses on well it'd be mckinder uh kagan speakman again from yale right that really focused on the sea power versus land power heartland versus coastal rim land strategies right the germans would be ratzel and hosshofer during the yeah. 20s and 30s can you hold that thought for half a second i want to interject back to turkey for half a second Okay. Uh, because this is now current information as far as uh, as the pipelines go. Turkey looks like they are trying to sign up on all this for a new Turkey hub going this way from up into Asia, uh, South Asia, you know, up into that area right there. Turkey would gain a lot out of this, uh, you know, from their power uh, area. Are you familiar with what's going on with the new things going on in turkey because that's huge coming in from that way up uh, how does that do you are you familiar with that did i sidetrack you permanently there oh no that's where i started actually uh this endeavor back in 2011 i was writing some reports for some people oh for, okay cool uh, what is it um i d let's put that on ice for a second okay and great that's right I was just thinking about how all this is playing out. So I'm sorry if I'm doing a chess match in my head and I was sitting there because that's a new topic that just surfaced uh, uh, as far as uh, contracts coming up. So, oh, no, it's an old, it's an old one. Oh, um, well, sorry. New to me. I, I'll shut up. Sorry, George. I, I'm enjoying too much. I'm sorry. This is too cool. Erdogan has always wanted to build, do a, a, a pan-Turkic. Okay yeah that's been there yeah. but okay cool never i'll shut up then <laughs> and, and pipelines is the key part of that because right uh, yeah well let's see baku is a turkic speaking country uh yeah i mean azerbaijan right and you know, turkmenistan across across the uh, the caspian uh kazakhstan and turkmenistan uh, yeah turkmenistan yeah and then going into uzbekistan kyrgyzstan is not necessarily but Tajikistan is right. And going into uh, Xinjiang province in western okay. China is actually eastern Turkestan. Right. Okay. So okay. Erdogan actually wants to reach into western China. I had to let people think about that a little bit. He actually wants to reach into, into western China with this. So that's, you know, you start to get wow. some tension where those Turkic stands, Russia and China and Turkey are competing for them. Got They're it. Oil and mineral rich and potentially 
can uh, produce a lot of agriculture. Yep. We're opening up a lot of can of worms here. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Yeah. So the, 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 like we could table this, those discussions for the next episode and continue your thought process. And I'll try not to sidetrack you again. Yeah. I, I, I was trying to go. Um, I, I'm I usually go around Eurasia. Okay. Uh, counterclockwise. Today, I kind of went back and forth a little bit, nine and three. Okay. Okay. Between Japan and, and, and uh and eastern europe because of the war in ukraine right because they keep on saying that you know putin attacked for no reason well if you go back and you start looking at the alfred there mahan videos you don't have to read the books you just just you just need to get maps and look at the uh, at the gist of it right he talks about cripple you know Mahan talks about crippling a country by crippling their trade or facilitating the trade for allies. So if you're following Mahan doctrine and then, yeah, McCann, uh, Mahan and then Mackinder, land power versus sea power, he's from Oxford, went to the United States. Uh, I He gave lectures during the, 20, uh, during the 20s and 30s in between the wars right. at Princeton, Columbia and Yale which is where Donald Kagan showed up, who's the father of Robert Kagan of Brookings Institute that's married to Victoria Newland, and Frederick Kagan, who's at American Enterprise Institute. They're right near, near each other in D.C. He right. was at West Point. And Kimberly Kagan, Frederick Kagan's wife, runs Institute for the Study of War, with Bill Crystal, which is really Project for New American Century renamed, but they hired General Jack Keane and, and David Petraeus is on the payroll. Wow. So just to give you a connection of how far the Yale Grand Strategies courses are into the, the think tanks and the intelligence community and right. the military, a lot of it comes through that family. Nicholas Spikeman, Speakman, uh, a, a, a Dutch guy, he was a maritime uh, merchant marine for the for the Dutch, spent wow. a lot of his time going between Amsterdam in the Black Sea and down to the Dutch East Indies in the 30s, went back to get his PhD and teach at Yale. And he wrote uh, several key books well, no, one key book, uh, no, two key books, talking about the necessity to hem in the Soviet Union. Actually, let's see, yeah, right out, it would be right out, as World War II was ending and the Cold War was beginning. Right. So he was, his thought heavily impacted George Kennan, who had the five power center doctrine. So that's where this, that's where this comes from. Okay. So that has a large impact on who runs our our government and how everything is, yeah, what our policy is based off of. You keep on seeing things, whether it's, you know, that old show Homeland where they're talking about, well, you know, tell me what the form, tell me what the Middle East policy is, and I'll then I'll tell you whether it's working or not. This is actually this is actually where the policy comes from. Okay. And, uh, just to reiterate, the United States has been in a regime change destabilization strategy basically from during the Cold War, uh, especially in Afghanistan, where Spignia Brzezinski and Stansfield Turner had Operation Cyclone to destabilize right. Central Asia. Then we went back to a nation building program, which it, well, whether on purpose or by accident, it ended up being a destabilization program. Then we left Afghanistan and just went full-fledged regime change destabilization strategy. There's articles that have come up about continued funding of the Taliban or 
repatriate right. their, their capital. I, I think you brought that up uh, recently in, in yeah. an article. It's been brought up on uh, on LinkedIn and other social media. Right. Uh, I forget the person's name, but why on news has talked about it. The Indian, well, Indian news was furious after we backed the Mujahideen. Right. And then we left that in chaos and then came back and funded the same groups again and left them with $80 billion worth of weapons and training. Right. The purpose of that is to destabilize that whole region and to destabilize Russian, Chinese, and even to some extent, Turkic infrastructural projects. They wanted, um, what they really want to do is break apart now, is break apart the Chinese Silk Road and Belt and Road Initiative. Right. But I want to, I kind of want to get back to that, back to the other area, because with, with Germany, if Germany, you know, the, I want to get back to Eastern Europe, why you need, why the Bush administration, well, why the Clinton administration followed by the Bush administration, so they're right. different. They're both the Union Party, I guess, is what Mearsheimer would call them. But still, they're different parties, and they did the same thing. They advanced NATO, and they advanced the EU, and then they advanced NATO. It's what they always do. They want to block in their pipelines and ports. That way, you can charge exorbitant fees so they don't lose the allies. You could have always moved just the EU without the NATO component. But if you did that, and and Russia did integrate with cheap natural gas to German industry. What would happen? Well, their Ger the, the German automobile industry would become even more competitive, price wise. Mm -hmm. They're already super competitive quality. All the German electronics, German chemicals, including and especially BASF's uh, uh, fertilizer plant. They just shut it down. They moved it to China. Yep. They've got to move it to where the gas is for the Hyber Bosch right. process. Yep. So if Germany had switched over, it's not just Germany. It's, you know, I emphasize it's the German world. Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Austria. Because the German pipeline network is extremely well developed. They can sell the oil and gas to everywhere else, not only in the German world, but all the old Warsaw Pact Slavic countries up and down the Danube River. Yep. So again, I want everybody to remember, the per it doesn't matter where pipelines are blown up or stopped diplomatically. The point is to get, they don't want the, the cheap Russian natural gas to get to the end user and the end user paying in rubles, because now we're at $34 trillion in debt. Right. If the global dollar of demand dropped, we go into hyperinflation. Right. So what they did, and then I want to get into the current crisis. I need to segue into this. Okay. What, what they did over the past you know, uh, three decades is block in Russia's pipelines and ports. Right. Russia only has one southward flowing river and that's the don river all their agricultural project products and mineral exports basically go through there or vladivostok right all their ports are naturally hemmed in anyway vladivostok is surrounded by the japanese island chain uh rostov on don is surrounded by sea of azov Crimea, it's inside the Black Sea, Dardanelles yep. Straits, uh, uh, and the uh, Bosphorus, and then out in the in the Mediterranean. So then you're still trapped by the Suez and the Straits of Gibraltar. So it's it's so trapped, 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 and trapped. It's all maritime check choke points. So if you followed wow. McMahon theory, once NATO and the U.S. and U.K., five eyes, starts to block in their pipelines and ports, according to Mahan, Mahan theory itself that the United States goes by, yeah, Russia would have to 
that would have to strike back. And Putin was adamant for them not to move into those areas. Again, the, the course of alter the course of action alternative would have been to make Poland, Ukraine, and Georgia neutral. So the point is to follow Mahan's aggression theory and block. Right. So it's not a, a Kantian peace plan. It's a geostrategic uh, crippling plan. So right. that's why that's why Putin attacked and our policy planners had to know it. And the viewing audience would know it if they just watch Mahan videos and McKinder videos. They'll understand yeah. the strategic you know, aspect of that region. Yep. So yeah, when you move into okay, well, let me go around and finish the one thing. So again, okay. So they stopped that German world and Russian world integration by getting into the Baltics, Poland, Ukraine, and Georgia, and you know, South Caucasus pipeline and the Bruzwa pipelines coming, Yamal pipelines coming east. Then they also they also spent a lot of money in influencing the elections in Georgia and back Chakashvili in 2004, and recently Pashinyan in Armenia. Right. Again, they want to block in anywhere where pipelines might go. Plus, they moved. Now, they moved. Just for point of clarification, was it the U.S. or Russia that? spent a lot of money on those elections i'm just asking for clarification the u.s that's what i thought i yeah, was just uh, asking yeah again people can look it up uh there's a guy named brian berletic out of mm -hmm. out of uh, germany i'm uh, germany out of bangkok that talks about that a lot yep um he he, he covers that southeast asia uh region pretty well right but again it's During the Cold War, the CIA backed a lot of uh, political action committee groups. Right. After the church committee hearings, that was taken out, mostly taken out, and put into the National Endowment for Democracy and some other groups right. that are then funded by Congress. They, in turn, fund a lot of NGOs and work with a lot of NGOs. So, yeah, it's just, um, they're just, a, a, well, and USAID and everything else. I mean, um, so he, he he speaks to that a lot. And people can, you know, can look at his show to back up what I'm saying, or just go to Wikipedia and start looking up, uh, looking up National Endowment for Democracy. So okay. they, they just funnel money into these groups. And of course, uh, big tech, you know, putting the internet every place having the internet service providers providers all go through Western backed um, uh, Silicon Valley groups, they export, okay. They might be locally owned, but they're funded and supplied by Western, okay. Right. Western hardware. So you, you can put two and two together of how they're siphoning it off. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who's collecting all the information on these people. We've all put our information on Facebook and LinkedIn and yep. uh, TikTok or, or whatever else you have out there. I don't know. But people already put their known associates on social media anyway. Right. And it's being collected. So uh, anyway. Yep. So you have that. And the United States starts to slap sanctions on Russia because it wants to also stop, well, they increase shelling in the Donbass right. to uh, induce Russia to attack, and I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. They slap sanctions on Russia to stop the Sakhalin Hokkaido project completely on the other side of the continent, because they don't want those projects to go through because then Japan might be tempted to eventually pay in rubles, just right. like Germany might be attempted to pay in rubles. Right. 
So going back, yeah, I was going to actually talk about going into Romania to tell, talk about how thoroughly this is thought out. Romania was another country that they that they moved the EU and, and NATO to rather quickly, and that's to control the lower Danube. Oh, yeah. So if you can control the lower Danube, you can stop Russian ships, barges. Okay, there's I think there's 12 locks in the Danube now, but you can stop Russian barges coming from the Novorossiysk area across the Black Sea and resupplying its old Warsaw packed countries through the Danube. Right. And immediately after after Nord Stream somehow blew up. Right. Again, you want to stop the natural gas going from Russia to the end user and the end user paying in rubles. Right. The AFD has been getting a lot more uh, a lot more popular with the rise of of uh, of energy prices, right? So somebody, you know, speaking to Nord Stream, somebody wanted to take that democratic process off the table, and it blew up. But also, right. the 101st Airborne Movement moved into Romania and Moldova, so they can control both sides of the day. Wow. Okay. Also, to keep in mind, because you start talking about other ways you can get oil and natural gas into Western Europe, and then you start to figure out that NATO has been there for decades. Wow. It's not by accident. The UK, you know, the Brits have been in fighting in Crimea and in the Black Sea for centuries now. They know the area well. That's what guided the policy. So when you look to see, well, oh, well, the Russian or the, the the Slavic countries like Hungary or Slovakia now with the election of FICO. Right. Or um or 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 Serbia that are more pro-Russian. And there's a lot of pro-Russian elements in Bulgaria, of course. Right. If they wanted, if they had a pro-Russian government and tried to buy uh oil, can't really ship natural gas that way. Right. But you can ship oil; it would go through the it go through the Danube. Again, if NATO controls the Danube, they can enforce the sanctions. If they don't control the Danube, they can't enforce the sanctions. So, wow, this is how well it was thought out. So then, when you get to the other side, like I said, the Russian sanctions also stop the Japanese pipeline, but. Japan bought out the Western companies that left. So a lot of people are saying, oh, mm-hmm. the government is going to be uh, pro-U.S. They're going to stay pro-U.S. They're rebuilding their, their Navy. They're going to be right with us there to fight China over Taiwan if they need to. Like Doug McGregor, I don't think so. I think they got their Navy to protect themselves. Yep. They got a course of action alternative to buy Russian oil and gas. Yep. Because the vulnerability is South Korea and Japan are in this and Taiwan are in the same boat as far as if you're getting most of your oil and natural gas, and then I want to get in the Silk Road and Belt, Belt Road thing. Right. Their oil and natural gas goes through Straits of Hormuz, Straits of Malacca, and then through South China Sea where all the different island chains are. Right. China falls at the nine dash line because they started rebuilding, they started building up those atolls and small artificial islands in the South China Sea so they can claim right. it as theirs. They're making them Coast Guard bases and then putting airstrips on them so they can control that. In a time of conflict, since South Korea and Japan import something like 90% of their of their energy yep. from the Middle East during a com- time of conflict, no matter who starts it, they get cut off. If they get no energy during a time of conflict, right. 
well, boy, without energy, without lights, without heating, air conditioning, refrigeration for food, right. gas, trucks, you go back into the Stone Age in a couple of months. Do you, I think that that is exactly why they are reauthorizing the Fukushima uh, atomics to come back online and, and really start expanding their atomics programs. Yeah. So, yeah, they're going to go for contingency plans. So they reinvested in Sakhalin. And there's always uh, across the bay in Vladivostok, they can always get LNG and oil from there. So during a time of conflict, if you're Japan or South Korea and you have a choice of either a star, uh, boy, just your economy would go to just about nothing under those circumstances. If you'd, they were, lose, you'd lose big amounts of population. Yeah. Or you buy your oil and natural gas at a much lower price and you live comfortably and right. you just put sides. So people are like, oh, yeah, the present government is just, you know, hates Japan and all these Asian rivalries. Well, it, it, if, if push comes to shove, it's, if it's starvation or living in luxury, uh, I, I, I think they're going to avoid World War III and live in luxury. I it, think so. Yeah. And they should. It should be Japan first. It should be your country first. Yeah. So, again, South Korea has got to be thinking the same thing. I reiterate how uh, Putin and other uh, Soviet or Soviet Russian officials have been visiting North Korea a lot lately. Yep. My bet is it's over oil and gas pipelines to South Korea is my bet. Nice. And okay, let's move to China, and then I okay. want to move to um, back to the Iran conflict. Uh, okay. Or or Gaza, Israel. Yeah. All right. So. In the 90s and 2000s, yeah, China had already moved earlier after Nixon's ping pong diplomacy started economic reforms in China and started moving more to, towards free market. The farm collectivization thing didn't work. They started to slowly abandon that. American foreign policy uh, or you know Clinton administration their strategy following the land power versus sea power strategies of, uh, well, you would be updating from Mahan, McKinder, Speakman, and you know, Kagan Speakman to, um, right. you would be on to Brzezinski and Wolfowitz at this, or at, at those points, is okay. to start, is to start using, I, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that you don't know what's in people's heads, but I think the idea was that they would form economic interdependency with China and peel them away from Russia. So you're still following Kennan's five power center doctrine and peeling China away from right. uh, inter pulling them into the Pacific Rim Alliance with the United States. So then you would be putting in that North American centric power center doctrine, you would be moving them into the Western mm -hmm. world. Now, what, what China did was integrate with the Silk Road Initiative. Right. The point of that is to get in the Russian um, Central Asian stands is to start rebuilding their, their, uh, the old Soviet railway first, and then pipelines, yeah, into Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, um, uh, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan into Iran. So they right. have pipelines going out of Urumqi into all of them. So that way you have overland logistical supply routes that are free from the maritime checkpoints and U.S. naval interdiction. Right. So They've been building that up so they're separated from Russia. Again, you know, speaking to, uh, I mean, the, yeah, Stalin died a long time ago, but whatever animosity they might be, they don't want to become totally under the thumb of, 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 the, of the new Russian Federation either. So their first move 
was to rebuild those overland logistical supply routes and gain more autonomy. Right. As the economy grew, they're no longer energy sufficient because their economic expansion grew. So they're getting more and more from the Middle East and Africa. So yes, militarily under Promethean dime, their economy grows, their military power grows, but their logistical supply routes become more vulnerable. So if you do Pamisi, dime, SWAT modeling, right. strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, the threat to mission becomes the maritime checkpoints. So you're back into the land sea power versus land power theories. I need to keep on making the connections because all these moves that they do, if you understand these theories, you understand why there's so much conflict all over Eurasia. And it's very easy to tell wherever there's a Russian and Chinese infrastructural project, there is some kind of trouble. It doesn't take a rocket scientist if you know these grand strategies to who's behind the trouble. Right. And whoever whoever blew up Nord Stream um, is emboldened because nothing happened to them. Right. Is that a fair statement? There doesn't seem to be a lot of people rushing out there to investigate that. Um, I don't get. I don't get it. I don't trying to find alternatives to Cy Hirsch's idea, uh, which seems to be the uh, Occam's razor at the moment. Uh, I do fact pattern, uh, hypothet- hypothetical deductive reasoning with the grand strategies as to who did it. Again, they don't want the Promethean dime integration. They want to block that first, and then they don't want people to leave the petrodollar and trade in euros because then there's nobody funding our debt. Their demand for the global dollar would collapse. There would be nobody funding our debt. We go into hyperinflation. So getting back to Silk Road. Right. The difference between the Silk Road initiative and the Belt and Road initiative is the Belt and Road initiative wants to build ports at the end of the Silk Road pipeline and railway network. So China want, was building uh, ports in Karachi, Gwadar, and then Chabahar. Right. Those are in, uh, those are in Baluchistan. Chabahar port is in Sistan, Baluchistan, Iran, okay. where there's a lot of trouble. And Gwadar is in, uh, is in Baluchistan, Pakistan. Again, the Brits build the, you know, put the country boundaries in between the ethnic groups and split them up. And it also, that also made Afghanistan landlocked, used to be all the way to the ocean. So they were building those three ports and there's an oil and gas field off of uh, Chakwa. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. My, my Burmese is really bad, but it's in, it's in uh, Southern Myanmar in between Yangon and Bangladesh. So yeah, the they're trying to push back the Bangladeshi invasion because this is what the Rohingya is. They have an open borders invasion there that's sponsored by NGOs, just right. like we have one here at our Southern border. And I will be going down to Panama pretty soon with Michael Yan. He nice. wants me he wants me to go down there and look at something. He'll, I'm sure he'll, well, he probably wants me to write something. So I'll find out what he wants me to see and write about when I get there. I'm sure he'll tell me that. But anyway, because the, the Belt and Road initiative to extend those ports out makes it so any ship containing any kind of, well, oil and natural gas, minerals, food, whatever, to be able to get to any port in West Asia and send it back to Chinese China in East Asia over right. and avoid as many logistical supply choke points as possible. Yep. It's to spread out and mitigate 
the U.S. Navy. Huh. Yeah. See, people throw around Silk Road Initiative, Belt and Road Initiative as it's the same thing. But when you put it in the context of the land power versus sea power as geostrategic theories, then wow. all of a sudden you start to make really dramatic distinctions and why the neocons in, in the UK and the US are starting to go crazy about the pipelines emanating out of Russia and the former Soviet Southern Republics emanating to either Western Europe or China. And I mentioned Japan and yep. I mentioned South Korea. I didn't mention India yet. Nope. Obviously, you can't. It's very difficult to build a pipeline because it have to either go through China or the old Tappy pipeline through right. Afghanistan and Pakistan, which India's rivals with China and rivals with Pakistan. Yep. So that's not going to work. India has has been wanting to build the Chabahar port to at least get oil, oil mm -hmm. and a quick. You can ship LNG, but it, it still costs more. Right. But but oil, uh, India has been buying everything they can from Russia's dark fleet and already buying in rubles. So, Correct. and they're buying everything they can get. And I applaud them for buying the lowest cost oil they can for their citizens. Yeah, there's two directions I want to go with this. Okay, great. Sorry. I'm sorry, George. I, I am oh, I just, uh, for, for my podcast. I am, I, if anybody knows me, I am really sitting on my hands right now because I'm fascinated. And I have had about 15 epiphanies while you're talking. So it just, yeah. again, I'm doing everything I can to shut up because your stuff is gold. Yeah. So if the choke points usually go through Strait of Hormuz out of, the Middle East, right, and through through the Straits of Malacca, going, you know, going west to east. Yep. Then Russian oil has to either come the other way through the Suez or you know through English Channel or whatever, around from the Arctic around, or all the way around Africa and Cape of Good Hope. Right. That's a long journey. Or it's got to go through the Straits of Malacca during a time of conflict choke points it's a no-go what they need is to build is to at least send that down to chabahar port by pipeline or railway yep so india was building trying to build chabahar port because of sanctions on iran they didn't modi got along very well with trump trump told him to go ahead and build it they didn't because they didn't want to get uh, they didn't want to run afoul of any other uh, United States sanctions, especially if, you know, if Trump didn't win. Right. But they were so angry at. The way the United States left Afghanistan, because they not only armed the Mujahideen once, which is the Sunni Pashtun Taliban. Right. Not only armed them once, but we came back and armed them again. So to, to say that Modi was furious at the United States would be an understatement. Wow. And deservedly so. They, so. Yeah. So they went back into the Javahar port. So they have a couple of uh, bursts that are, uh, that are already operational. And China has a few. Okay. They have highways between Zahedin through Cash down to Chabahar Port, but they need about what is it? I think it was, was it 500 kilometers of railway yeah. to link it. And that's what the hold up. It's a little bit diff difficult going through the mountain ranges. I guess they got to bore some tunnels or something. So it's not just laying track, it's it's actually got has some challenges to it. Right. But this is one area where both India and China agree on is that railway system needs to go through. They may not agree on very much, but they agree on that one stretch of rail link. What that does for Russia, it allows them to trade 
directly on a shorter route over land with a short shipping route because it's just got to go from uh, Chabahar port, you know, right. around, around Pakistan, and then they can offload in, in Gujarat, India. So then you're only talking about a few hundred miles. So it's not that big of a trip. Right. Indian, Indian goods can go back up north and to balance out trade. But there's another facet in this, and that is every Silicon Valley has a lot of offices in New Delhi yes. and, and in Mumbai. You know, if anybody that's been to India, they see the big, these big, huge office parks uh, outside on the outskirts of the city. And yeah, it's every company that you can think of. It's just like going out the Dulles Toll Road between Washington yeah. and Dulles, where you have every military industrial complex, high tech company along those roads. Right. It's the same thing. So you just have to ask yourself, why is why is is uh, why was Russia so eager to give discounted oil to India? A lot of people are like, oh, India is screwing over Russia. Oh, Russia's getting the short end of the stick. Well, I'm just going to take go way out on a limb and saying they're buying a lot of um, a lot of the higher up engineers to go build these same technologies inside Russia. Wow, that's huge. Okay, so that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out all these U.S. companies just left Russia. So what's going to fill the void? It's been Chinese car companies have been filling. Okay, they've been filling that void. People could see the war coming in Ukraine ever since the Euro Maidan revolution. Right. I don't want to get into that right now. It's a topic for another day, but yeah. they've been aggressively trying to integrate and anticipate the departure of Western companies. That's why when they expected Russia to fall apart with the sanctions, they have actually been getting stronger. Yep. Russia, China, and India have been uh expect anticipating this for a long time right they're very well prepared on that note i want to get to gaza but uh, i'm going to put a placeholder here because what we described is china russia and india and south africa which happens to be BRICS, and you know and brazil and that is doing the mechanism to get away from the dollar. I'm going to hold that for another yeah. talk with you because everything you're describing fits into the financial arm of this going yeah. away from SWIFT, going into BRICS, and then doing that. But I now know more on that. So let's then, that way I can put this here and on our next series, go back into some of those things because I want to do get into Gaza now. But I just wanted to put that in there if that's okay. Now, one more sentence when you're talking about BRICS. Again, okay. What is the Belt and Road Initiative have to have the ports in Guadar, um, Chabahar, Guadar, Karachi, and Chakwa about? Right. Well, now you ships from Africa can dock and offload in Western Asia and send everything. If South, okay, South Africa is part of BRICS and China's been spending um, all kinds of money. Right. Infrastructural and mining and oil and natural gas products, uh, projects rather, all over Africa. So it's not just South Africa. But again, you need infrastructural, you know, transportation infrastructure to integrate them. In that case, right. it's for water. So you need the ports. So for bricks to work, you need that port system of the Belt and Road initi Initiative to connect them. Wow. I haven't put, I haven't put the, all of this part uh, together, and I cannot wait to follow up with some of the this other stuff as well. Holy yeah. smokes. This, this is putting a lot of holes together for me, George. And if you include the Brazilian part, 
well, how would Brazil trade? Because if you're, it's not just a currency, right? There's still, a, there's a bunch of points to make here because you have to balance trade by sending physical goods at some point, right? You know, if you have somebody, if you're holding, you know, trillion dollars in someone else's currencies, eventually you got to go buy either goods and balance, uh, balance trade, current right. account. Or you have to go in those countries and buy operating companies. So then the ships would have to go around Cape of Good Hope. If they couldn't go through the Pacific, Cape of Good Horn, they right. got to go. Brazil would have to go around one of the capes no matter what. So then you would again, you would you would want to have alternatives to where you can drop either your tanker ships, LNG ships or cargo ships and send everything by pipeline, highway or railway. Railway right. being the best. Wow. Okay. Wow. Let's end it. Let's do a segment and then get into the conflict in Iran. Okay. So as everybody knows, yeah, Hamas is a Sunni group by uh, the Egypt Muslim Brotherhood they attacked Israel. Israel didn't, the IDF didn't respond for five hours. So I, I don't know anybody sure. believes that that wasn't, that the damage wasn't embellished in order to justify an overwhelming counterattack, uh, like Machiavelli, yes. very Machiavelli to manipulate emotions. There's even discussion about how they moved that, that concert, that rave, from one side of Ashkelon to the other, closer to the border, to actually make it easier. A little bait uh, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some people have said that. Wow. So that went on. So there's a there's the two dominant theories as to why they did that is to one level Gaza so they could get, um, so they could have so Israel could have a better claim to the Gaza marine oil and gas field that, that was discovered in 2000. Right. So that's one motivation for doing it. And another motivation is to uh, reinitiate the idea of the Ben-Gurion Canal going from Elot and, and uh, Aqaba. But that actually is supposed to wind up just north of Gaza. I right. guess you could send it straight through Gaza you could route it. There's different ways you could route that. But um, I, I kind of discount those because if you could send it around Gaza, they could do that without embellishing the Hamas attack. They could just, you know, there's uh, there's a whole bunch of different right. points on the maps of how that could have gone. Yeah, you wouldn't need to do that to build that canal. You could just build it. Right. Just to give some background uh, in why that canal was ever proposed, I think that's about a 220 mile canal. The yeah. Suez Canal is about 120 miles, I believe. You know, people right. could check the exact mileage, but it's basically twice as long or something. The Suez Canal has been, uh, uh, Abdel Nasser. Uh, Blocked it in 1956 during the Suez, the 56 Suez Canal crisis. Right. It's blocked at other time between between the Arab Israeli War and the uh, you know the Yom Kippur War, and it, it's been blocked by accident with the uh, with that ship stuck in it. The, the, the Evergreen uh, was just yeah, stuck, yeah. and boy, that broke the supply chain. Holy smokes! So, for geostrategic reasons, Israel would like to have another way to ship goods and right. not depend on the Suez Canal controlled by the Arabs. Okay. I think as everybody in this group would know, the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac have never gotten along. That is, yes. So none of this is new. They will always be fighting. Each one believes that they're that they're the chosen people and the other brother is the imposter. Right. Nothing, no Western, uh, you know, mediation, you know, conflict resolution theory is ever going to change that. 
It right. is in their religions, especially for the hardcore fanatics. Did the Abram Accords come as close as we ever have, though? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, however, short lived. Yeah. Um, it seemed like it was the, it was the, it was the breakthrough. And I think that could, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cause I keep yeah, jumping I, in I, on these things. So I want to make an aside here. Okay. And that is, you know, more like a, more like an end note off to the side, but that will Trump's first visit was to Riyadh. In January, or was it? Yeah, January, February of uh, whenever that was of, of, of 2017. Right. He gets a huge welcome by uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, unbelievable uh, red carpet, the whole uh, display of swords not ever done for other leaders. He got a rollout. Is that correct? Yes. He leaves. The next thing Mohammed bin Salman does is lock up 165 of the oil sheets in the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Yep. A month later, it's followed by the sanctions on Qatar. Also joined by the UAE. All right. So what happened? Because nobody talks about it. They'll talk about, I don't know, Mohammed bin Salman. Oh, again, it, you know, he he's crazy. There's no rationale. He doesn't know right. what he's doing. You know, the, the, the media just is, uh, it's just, yeah, it's just, they're just really dumb at some point. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the Trump administration showed Mohammed bin Salman the transcripts of who's been supporting the Sunni VEOs. Right. VEOs are violent extremist organizations. I just call them Sunni VEOs because the terms of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra Front, um, you know, the, the Taliban, the Mujahideen, the Khani Network, you know, you have even different ethnicities is... Um, it's meant to confuse if you just look at them as Sunni VEOs and make things simple. Right. The the house of been uh, the house of Saad has always been viewed as an illegitimate form of government in Islam because the first four caliphs, like we were talking off air before the other day, right, was that the imams elected the caliph. So the house any families dynasty is illegitimate form of government in islam and any western form of government is illegitimate right islam the shia revolution in 79 they have a they had a theocracy elected by the imams that is a legitimate form of government in islam So then the Sunnis wanted the same thing. So, so you had the Tehran revolution, the Shia revolution from 78 mm -hmm. to early 79 with the hostage crisis under the Carter administration. But you also had the Arab oil sheiks funding the radical mosques and madrasas, or the, I should say the Salafi Wahhabi mosques and madrasas in Pakistan under General Zihad and uh, uh, after he uh, assassinated Bhutto. That changed the whole complexion of that region from Hanafi Sunni, the more uh, moderate forms of Islam to more radical. They also started building, well, once you build the madrasas, okay, from 1980 to 2000, you're gonna start to have your K through 12 and K through college groups graduating to where they can teach in more madrasas on right. both sides of the Suleiman Mountains. Now that's key because the Taliban, the Sunni Pashtun Taliban is way stronger than what our government or what the journalists would like you to believe. Right. It shifted 
that. So why did it shift? The Israeli scholars think that the, are certain that the Pashtun are six of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. I might be explaining this in a slightly different order because of the way you brought it up in conversation than I okay. usually do, but we're just going to go at it this way. Okay. So they believe that they're uniting the sons of Abraham, both Ishmael and Isaac's side, to march to Israel to kick out the, uh, the sons of Abraham who stayed Jewish and did not follow the correct prophet path. Right. Because people wonder what the fascination between the, the Arabians and the Pashtun. And it's that. And also what changed that area from being the more moderate forms of Islam in, in the 60s and 70s when it used to be the hippie trail going to Shangri-La in the, in the in the Kashmir mountains of northern Pakistan, what radicalized it, and it was General Zia Al Haq of Pakistan. He was an Islamist. Okay. Now you can also argue, since he was an Islamist, that took power in um, at the blessing of the imams that his military form of government is also a caliphate. So in Brzezinski and Stansfield Turner, Brzezinski wrote the grand chessboard in the 90s after the Wolfowitz doctrine of how to move in and create instability into Central Asia. At, at the, in the 70s, General Zia al Haq wanted to displace atheistic Marxism and push it out of all the stands, Afghanistan, all of them. Right. Brzezinski and uh, and Stansfield Turner, because he was he's an Annapolis War College grad uh, and uh, and Newport Naval War College grad. They're playing the great game to keep Russia from getting the warm water port in Baluchistan. Well, what what that's created. Is a Frankenstein monster that actually wants to move through. That actually wants to move through Shia Iran. So when you had the Shia revolution in Tehran, what you saw was the. Uh, well, the the Saudis, but it, it's really it's it's not just them. It, it's it's all the Sunnis in the other countries also in in the Arabian Peninsula, trying to go to Pakistan and support and radicalize the Pashtun to surround Shia Iran on both sides. Now, why is that important? It's because this, the, the, uh, the end times prophecies are not in the Quran, they're in the Sunnah and the Hadith. So the criteria for the end times prophecies is they have to come from the snow-capped mountains of the Khorasan, and people can watch videos of some of the Pakistani imams talk about this. Just, right. just Google black flags of the Khorasan. They can watch these videos themselves. Okay. So the idea is they have to go through Iran. So Afghanistan, and this is important, Afghanistan is the old traditional eastern Khorasan, and modern-day Iran, Persia, is in Western Khorasan. So once Iran has had a theocracy in Western Khorasan and links with the Alawite Shia in Lebanon and Syria, then they're in position to attack Israel from the north and fulfill all, the, all their end times prophecies. So over the last four or five decades, you base, you know, depending on where you want to draw the dividing line, I kind of put the dividing line at, at 79, but it actually, I actually backed it up to, to uh, a little bit earlier with General Z.L. Hook, is you have a race between the Sunnis and the Shia of who can come from the Khorasan and attack Israel first. As of right now, 
the Iranians, the Shia, have been supporting Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and southern Shia. I, I have a paper on that. I don't think I posted it anywhere yet. Okay. So right now, they're in position, and they've been stockpiling missiles there for decades. Now, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, their special operation indigenous force training element is Al-Quds Force. Al-Quds Force stands for, that's the Arabic word for Jerusalem. It exists hmm. for no other reason than to attack Jerusalem, take it over, and bring back Jesus Christ that announces, no, he's not the Messiah. The Mahdi's coming, and that's the Messiah. There's different connotations of what the Messiah is about, but they have a kingdom on earth. They don't have an end times prophecy like Christianity, because we, mm -hmm. we have a death and a heaven outside of time, and we have an end times prophecy that's outside of time, not in time. Okay, the, yes. the religions, the religions are metaphysically very different. Marxism, in that sense, is metaphysically similar to the, these forms of Zionism and or end times uh, Islamic Mahdi wow. prophecy. Yeah, I, uh, Martin Heidegger got into that and, and Leo Strauss is where, I, is where I get that from academically or okay. philosophically. Okay. Theologically too, but... Um, so right now there's a race and what the imam uh, in Pakistan, what they've been talking about right. is they just say, well, how are they going to get through Iran with the Rev Revolutionary Guard Corps being so strong? And what, there's, what they said was, uh, is, you know, Rome, meaning the West, will somehow create a path. Right. Well, sure enough, with GWAT, We've destabilized the region with, you know, back to Operation Cyclone. We've right. actually created a path. So our people in our administration had been talking about the um, how the United States has stabilized southern Iraq. Pretty much from Baghdad or uh eastern diala province on down from baghdad all the way down to alfa when it hits the ocean right it's, that's shia arabs going through all those oil fields down there the shia holy places in karbala and the Jaff are located down there and there's a lot of persian arab the, the signs in all these places are in farsi and arabic right so there's a lot of back and forth. So there's actually to say that the United States stabilized the area that Iraq is 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 not really true. Iran really stabilized it. Hmm. So now they can build their logistical supply routes all the way to to Alawite Shia. Wow. Good force is is exist to train the indigenous people in Lebanon, southern Syria, Hezbollah, and clear the logistical supply routes with the Shia government. It does have to go through uh, Shia Ramadi, or I mean Sunni Ramadi areas. Now, how do I want to explain this next part? What the United or what? I should say, somehow, Al-Qaeda in Iraq that was defeated by the sons of Iraq in Ramadi somehow resurfaced and started fighting in Syria. Okay. So you have a lot of moving parts here. That was done to A, stop Al-Quds force from uh, formulating the Shia crescent to link the Shia Persians, the Shia Arabs in Iraq, and the Alawite Shia in Syria and Lebanon from forming that logistical supply bridge. It does something else that's very important also. Wow. The pipeline going from Sunni-ruled Qatar, where I right. just was last week, 
through South through Sunni Saudi Arabia, trying to get to Sunni Turkey to go to Europe. So you have alternative gas pipelines to to the Russian gap, gas pipelines coming east to west. Right. It's also blocked by that free Syrian army. Again, the Sunni VEOs, the acronyms like Chomsky's um uh uh oh what the um uh, the 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 worthy victims and the unworthy victims and manufacturing consent is what I was looking for. Okay. They change the names when they're trying to manufacture consent. So they, the West needed that pipeline to go through so they could slap sanctions on Russia. Right. And they needed to block the Sunni sand. Um, the Nuni, the Sun, I mean, the Shia land bridge. Starting to get my groups a little bit mixed up. But so it's to block those two things. So the Arab Spring just happened to happen in 2012 to block those developments. Or actually, I should say, wow. to make a pipeline possible and to block the Shia crescent at the same time. So of course, General Austin goes over there. He, everybody can you know look at his testimony to Congress. He has five hundred million dollars to train the you know the Free Syrian Army. The right. Sunni. Of course, at the end of this, only eleven people he can still account for. The rest of the people disappeared with their training, armored vehicles and weapons, their gun trucks. So then you got Al Qaeda in Iraq, which changed its names to ISIS or ISIL. And you also have Jabal al Nusra, which is more, uh, that's Al Qaeda. So um, they're still, well, Al Zawahiri died, but they're still allied to him. But at some mm -hmm. point, they get together. They were in Idlib about to drive through Damascus. Their goal was to drive the Shia clear through Damascus into Beirut and out to the sea and wipe away Hezbollah. Right. Point being is then you would still, they would still need to drive the Pashtun armies out of, out of East Khorasan through Iran to meet end times prophecies. So you get a whole bunch of things occurring here at once. That's why I wanted to stay out of the Turkish thing. Okay, got it. Because then we got too many balls in the air for people to track. <laughs> so where we are now is Trump came in and cut back the Sunni VEOs. Wait, let me back this up a little second. Okay. Stop the Sunni VEOs because they were about to go through Damascus, that's when Putin came in and bombed back the Sunni VEOs and pushed them back. What he did was he set the war back to neutral. So the two would continue fighting. Right. Also not, and this is another important point that, that needs to be made. One line in one CNN article mentions two, 247 fuel trucks were strafed crossing into, into Turkey, headed to the refineries in the Sehan area. Right. Well, Putin strafed them, but the big story is what are they doing there? Because if you, if you look at back in 2015, if you looked at, if you Googled um, the, the funding of ISIS, one video that comes up laughable by CNN, and keep in mind, they have an office in Doha and an office in Ankara, is that, I forget who the reporter was, it was a long time ago, but he's he's out there with the green uh, night vision watching bongo trucks with 55-gallon drums of oil on the back of it. And okay, they're sick, so that's 
uh, retail price is 300 bucks, wholesale price is half, 150 bucks. You have to pay people off going through checkpoints. Now you're down to 75 bucks per truck truckload. That guy is barely feeding his family. You're not funding a $13 million a day war that no. the law Court journal estimates that that's costing by the Sunni VEOs. So how are you funding the Sunnis? How are they funding that? Well, they're funding it with the oil tanker trucks going through Sehan. Of course, as far as news that's reporting this, and other outlets, because everything is on is on uh, is on other social media, maybe right. Telegram, or recent, but Bars News used to report it back then because the Shia are always going to rat out the Sunnis, and the Sunnis are always going to rat out the Shia. And I have Arabic Arabic speakers uh, that I have uh, access to, right? Uh, along with Kurdish speakers and everything else that are continuously interpreting the news for me and watching it. So yeah, it, it's it's been reported everywhere, but in Western media. No. So I want to I want to run through this because it's really important. Because you can't do anything with an individual can't do anything with crude oil. Right. So first of all, you got to get the oil out, which means you need petroleum engineers and that are uh, run by multinational corporations. Right. Then you have trucking companies that have to be run by multinational corporations. Right. You, could, you need to get it across the Turkish border, which requires state actor complicity of Erdogan and his family. And it's well known within, within Turkey. He was supporting the Sunni groups because he's Sunni. Right. You also have, you can't, an ind individual can't do anything with crude oil. You have to have access to refineries and or shipping companies. So you need ocean going shipping tankers. So how many multinational corporations just does it take in the first thousand miles of this trip? Then right. you need to ship it to wherever your end user is, get paid, probably more likely in dollars. Right. Or, or even if you ship it in, in, in large sums of crypto, it's still got to be in dollars for a minute. Right. So you need big multinational banking institutions to do this. Then you need to take the proceeds of that, buy weapons, but you're buying weapons in such quantity that again, you have to buy them from multinational corporations that make it, but you have to, ha you have, to have state actor complicity. Yep. Again, then you have to have trucking companies to ship that to the ports, who then put it on ships, take it back to Sahan, and then truck it back into the Sunni, Sunni VEOs. Wow. So, so if you just flow chart the amount of steps it takes to do that, it takes every J sec or G section function of a nation state military to fund those Sunni VEOs to fight Bashar al-Assad, the, the, the Shia. Wow. Um, if I can just watch videos on YouTube and figure that out, one would think that all the governments can also. I mean, one would think, right? Oh, yeah. Again, I, I'm, I'm reading the Long War Journal every day. Yep. Former generals run that. So if I can figure it out, they can. Certainly Putin did because he bombed the tanker trucks. <laughs> CNN has that in one blurb but doesn't do the kind of flow charting that I did of what it would take. Right. Then you ask yourself, well, who would be funding Sunni violent extremist organizations? The answer would be Sunni, other Sunni violent, I mean, other Sunnis. Yep. So they would need Sunni based multinational corporations. And where would you find those? Well, in the Arabian Peninsula. Right. All right, this is a very long explanation of why Trump went to Riyadh. So he would be probably handing him the transcripts to Mohammed bin Salman of who's funding these different groups and he locks them up. Wow. Okay, so then the money is flowing through the money centers of either Qatar 
or UAE. Right. They had to. UAE has their financial center in between, okay, you know, it's near the Burj Khalifa. And the people who run that is basically the city of London. They're, you know, the, the city of London, the square mile is yep. separate from the rest of the UK. They have their, they have different banking rules than the rest of the UK as a, as we know from the Panama papers. Right. Right. But the rules that are in the city of London is there is no rules. The same within uh, the same within in that area of Dubai. Very nice, by the way. I love to go there. <laughs> so you have these monies, the money is flowing through the different banking centers and the, yeah, they, the people that live there know, you know, they right. know. But for some reason, other than Alistair Crook, who's published a lot of papers in the Huffington Post, which he's the most knowledgeable person, I think, on the Middle East. Lately, he's been on um, Judge Napolitano's show a lot. Okay. I always like to listen to him, but I've been listening to him for over 10 years now. So, yeah, Trump leaves and they and they slap the two sanctions. Well, people wonder what it was. Well, it's, it's over. Who's funding those those Sunni violent extremist organizations? Because those, those are the same people that want to overthrow the House of Saud. Now, the House of Saud does not issue its own military live live ammunition. They buy all these foreign military sales from Western power, but right. yet they give their own army live ammunition. There's, the reason is, first thing that they would overdo is overthrow the House of Saud and, and, and put a caliph in, into play, which while well, Abu Baker al-Baghdadi was the Sunni caliph for that brief moment before he was killed by uh, the Trump administration. Yeah, he would have actually been in charge of Saudi Arabia with all the oil reserves. Wow. So when people start to say, well, we need to stop dealing with, with the House of Saud because of their links to terrorism and 9-11 and all of that. They're not right. making a distinction of who would replace the House of Saud, and it would be the Sunni VEOs. It would be the Wahhabi groups. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I mentioned Alistair Crook because he did several papers on why um, why Saudi Arabia is, he calls it the Saudi time bomb, as do others. Right. But give the audience an idea of what a tinderbox that, that you know, that, well, it's not just Saudi, it's, it's the other areas also. Right. So you have this tremendous... Uh, this tremendous breakout or encirclement of Iran going on since the 80s and then the, then the Shia Persians and the Shia Arabs trying to break out of that encirclement is what's right. been occurring for the past four decades. So now I want to get into what I've been talking about before right? with shutting off those with the United States taking over, blocking the pipelines, and then putting the sanctions on Russia. So now the United okay. States has cut its allies off from their critical energy supplies. And then replacing it with LNG, which is a third more expensive. So you're going to have tremendous drop in supply, and you're going to have demand pull and cost push inflations. Right. And they're going to cover it with monetary inflation. All right. I'm not making this up. This is No, I'm I'm with you because I've also I'm again, I'm having to shut my mouth cuz you're making sense. All right. So So now Russia now we're back to where I started like an hour ago. Right. These little things are going on and everything is a separate explanation. So I've been saying you're going to have high levels in, of inflation after 30 trillion we had quantitative easing. Right. But again, it's the, the dollar has been the best dirty shirt around and it still has it's we didn't experience high inflation here because of external demand outside the United States. Okay? Right. Yeah. But 
So then I was saying you're going to have inflation. I've been saying this for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. You're going to have inflation at 35 trillion, but we weren't supposed to hit 35 trillion according to GAO estimates until 2027, 2028. Right. We're supposed to hit, I'm sorry. Yeah, we weren't supposed to hit 30 trillion until 27, 2028, 10 years ago. And we weren't supposed to hit 35 trillion until 2033. But after COVID, and with a lot of left wing right. spending in the Senate, Green New Deal expenditures, all of that, we're already at 34 right. trillion in 2023. So right. scales, my inflationary scales have been moved down eight years. Combine that with the sanctions on Russia, and you've cut off the energy supplies of Western Europe and the deindustrializations of Germany, and Russia didn't collapse. So now the powers that be are probably in a real jam because we're going to hit hyperinflation at 40 trillion because the amount of interest payments on the debt are going to start are going to start exceeding all the DOD expenditures. And right. how can that be if we're going to go into World War III and to, to stay solvent, you would have to cut out all the Pentagon expenditures. You can't right. do that. So then would you cut all the welfare state expenditures? Well, the left marches its progress or measures its progress and the march to socialism um, by the expansion of the of the welfare right. state bureaucracies. So they're not going to budge. So if the neocons can't expand the military to control, to win World War III, and the left wing isn't going to cut back social service spending, then we're headed towards 40 trillion at a time we're inducing cost push inflation in the energy sector in Western Europe. So now we're gonna hit, now wow. they have to have inflation is gonna go higher. They can't crank up interest rates because then people won't be able to make their car loans and their mortgages. So now what are they gonna do? See, this is why I don't buy, they're bombing Gaza because of the, of the canal and the oil field patch. Right. What is to replace is to replace that Russian gas where all those pipelines go north of the Caspian, right? They go south of the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. So again, 2004, the United States heavily influenced the Georgian elections and, and backed Shakashvili in Georgia. Then they ran the BTC pipeline from Baku to Blisi to Kars, uh, Eastern Turkey, to Sehan. Right. Wanted to build, and Fiona Hill in 2004 did an article for Brookings Institution, of course, you know, that Kagan's and Newland are run, uh, run that, just happened to. Right. Be. I'm sure, it's I'm sure it's all coincidental. I'm sure. So a pipeline from Batumi, Georgia, underneath the Black Sea to Burgas, Bulgaria. That hasn't been realized. But the next goal was to move into Armenia, where they recently backed Pashinyan, who readily gave up the Artsakh area to the Azeris, and so the Armenians, just look at LinkedIn. Right. The Armenians are furious because they don't know why this is occurring. They need a pipeline that goes through Iran, through Armenia, through Georgia, to Batumi, and then they build need to build an undersea pipeline to Bargas, Bulgaria, or run it and tie it into the BTC pipeline and run it through, run it through Turkey. Right or reactivate the, um, the debris pipeline that goes into Southern Turkey. Mm -hmm. Well, to do that, 
and I'm going to tie up a lot of loose ends here. It took me long because there's a lot of. Oh, movement. yeah. To do that, you have to destabilize Iran first. So Sunni Hamas attacks Israel out of the Gaza and they're blaming Shia Iran. Now, there's some circumstances where the Sunni and Shia will will fund and supply the opposite group to attack a Western interest. Oh, yeah. There is times where they do that. But when push comes to shove, they're both trying to attack, get in position to attack Israel first and fulfill the end times prophecy. What the United States is doing, I, well, I, what the West is doing, it, there's other actors involved. It's not right. just... Oh, yeah. Is interjecting Iran. Now, Iran does back Hezbollah because right. they want Hezbollah to attack Israel that way they win the Mahdi game, the Mahdi right. race. But in this case, the West is trying to, in, is in my my guess, right? is they want to destabilize Iran by backing, they, or maybe I should say, it's coincidental that there's been unrest in, in Sistan, Baluchistan, in the Baluch areas of Southern Iran, and the Azeri and Kurdish areas of northeastern Iran, if they could do a regime change destabilization operation in Iran and then restabilize it and build a South Caspian Sea pipeline, they, right. would, they would have to do that before we hit the $40 trillion mark. So there is a three-way race for the secular grand strategies ideologues to get this pipeline through at the same time as there is a see at there is a theological end times race between the uh, Chabab Lubavitch faction of the Israelis that think Rebbe Snirshin is the Messiah. Wow. And you have the, Sin the Sunni versus Shia end times race. See, now this is all intersecting. I know it took me a long time to explain this. Uh, but I'm following it. This is incredible. Yeah, you have the secular geostrategic strategies of the major powers, but you also have the end time strategies between the religious factions. Right. Now, this is with this Israeli invasion you have everything intersecting at once. Right. So this is the first time in the history that things have intersected to this degree. So I think uh, this is going to be, and it's occurring at a time where we're going to have a very contentious election year. Right. Because... If Trump is elected and he tries to undo the deep state, you're going to have election turmoil in the United States as there's turmoil over here. Right. So I think we can end this podcast by talking about there's going to be so much destabilization and possibly energy riots in Western Europe after all the huge migration flows and the pro-Palestinian riots in Western Europe. Took me a long time to get there, but that's the conclusion you have. Uh, uh, yeah. George, this has been absolutely one of the best single conversations I've ever had. I'm going to be quite honest. Um, I have never put, I, I always believe that People don't look at a cause and effect, the second order magnitude uh, impact of decisions. And I'm sitting here, I'm going to have to listen to this about 16 times to write the article to go out with this, oh. because this is about one of the single best discussions that I've had. And you uh, should write books uh, on this topic. You're a national resource. They're, they're forthcoming. 
I have to I have to survive the year along with the elections. Oh, I hear you. <laughs> but but you know, George, this explanation, and I I don't want to kid you. I I I've read the Book of Quran. I think one of the the I've read the Book of Mormon. I love all this. You're the only one that has truly tied this whole mechanism. And I've always said that I like to think that I know something. Holy smokes, Batman, I don't know a thing. I mean, this is absolutely a fantastic. And I know that we're going to have several more in this series because this is such an important topic, George that we're going to get the story out for you and i cannot wait to get it out there george how do people get a hold of you on your linkedin i guess is the best way oh, well or, LinkedIn or uh george.mcmillan at impactanalytics.com okay uh, tim's organization uh, okay so, and again we need um to, tim's got the energy business i want to form a consultancy business so i can stay at this full time Right. Have several manuscripts that are uh, that are made for various methodological reasons that I need to put out. I would like to do geopolitical risk assessment analysis for any oil companies or financial companies. Wow. That uh, that would like to hire us because there's it's all in open source media, but it's but not put together. It's not put together. Yeah. No. And boy, I wrote, I published something on LinkedIn a while back. Okay. A, a few, well, okay, a whole bunch of things. But one of them was the, since people don't go to church anymore. Right. We have a secular atheistic country now. The people that run our government institutions don't know enough about the Abrahamic religions to understand what I just said. Right. They don't. And that, see, that's a big problem because they're just, and then they don't know enough to, to, to double expose the problem. They don't know enough about the grand strategies and how to integrate economic development strategy into it. it took, you know, that's another yeah, discussion. Oh, oh, yeah. When we start to get into the other facets and start to break it, break down fact patterns in different regions and start talking about specific routes. Right. You know, I'll have more time to elaborate what's been going on because when you, as we become more secular, people aren't reading the Bible cover to cover anymore. Nope. I used to spend a lot of time, especially uh, during the mid to late nineties, talking to rabbis about Rebbe Sneerson. I found that fascinating. I, I yeah. you know, I love that kind of discussion. I I absolutely love it as well too. Um, people that don't understand what drives other people don't understand what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. In in the field of economics, they have rational choice models, and the way you operationalize that is rational actor, belief, preference, constraint models. So I get that's how you start to build geostrategic models. I yep. start to do rudimentary explanations of that in some of my papers. My slide sets that I want to turn in, into books that are like 250, 300 slide sets long. Right. Go more detail on how to do that theoretical model building. Wow. It's, it's important that people understand how the disciplines integrate. Because since the, um, since the 1960s, liberals took the department chairs, uh, evolutionary yeah. psychologists, uh, Tubi and Cosmetis out of UCSB wrote a, a very, very important paper in 1992 yep. called the Psychological Foundations of Culture that talk about how the left has abandoned the scientific project. It's a separate discussion, but I do a Hume Smith versus Marx Engels analysis because all the Marx Engels theories in philosophy and the empirical sciences should have been discarded. Right. It should have been gone down to a Hume Smith model. They wrote a long time ago. Modern economics, well, let me back up just a second. Those two groups, those comparisons I make, are the only ones that wrote on the foundational political, economic, and geopolitical levels. Right. So they're 
they wrote on the full lateral spectrum and you can compare them on the different levels. So all those theories should have, all the Marx Engels theories, Rousseau Marx Engels theories should have been thrown out. So the new school, Frankfurt school, all that should have been done. It should have right. gone to a Hume Smith model and then upgraded with a modern series of empirical measures. And all of that it actually has already existed. So from doing that framework, uh, is how I radic is how I can readily build uh, build uh, troubleshooting models and recognize patterns very very quickly. Oh, wow! Yeah. I'll tell you, George. Um, we're going to stop it here, but we've got a series coming up with you, and uh, I can see why any energy company, any energy company, would want to hire your firm to really understand the plays and where the pipelines, where the oil, this is huge. You are a true uh, yeah. asset. So thank you so much. Thank you. I do. I appreciate your time and look forward to visiting with you again. This is huge. Thanks. Thanks.